Teachers, does setting up centers in your classroom stress you out? Are you looking for ways to make your sensory table more fun and engaging for your kids this year? Or maybe you just like taking a sneak peek into other teachers' classrooms. If any of that describes you, then you're in the right place. This episode of Elevating Early Childhood is part of a series I'm doing called Learning Center Tours, where I draw back the curtain on each center for you. So be sure to stick around until the very end because you never know when there might be a freebie printable waiting for you. So the truth about the Sensory Table Center is that it can be challenging to manage for several reasons. First, there is potential for big messes in this center, so you'll have to consider things like how will you get your kids to help with cleanup in this area without making more work for yourself, and how to protect your floors from damage at the same time. Of course, one of the biggest challenges is figuring out what to put in your sensory table on day one and how to change the materials in this center throughout the year to make sure your kids are engaged and having fun. Let's take a look at ways to solve some of these challenges. You can set your kids up for success from day one when you use things like a sign for each center in your classroom. So I have all of these center signs with the benefits listed below. That's for the adults in the classroom, but it's really important to let your kids know what you're gonna call this center all year long. So whatever you're gonna call it is what you're gonna name the top of the um, page with. So I'm calling it the sensory center, so that's the name there. And then it's gonna correspond with a picture. So we need visual cues to help our kids understand because young children learn in pictures up until about the age of six. So this is for preschool, so we're talking about children ages three to five. You need to have the name, and that name needs to stay consistent all year long, and you need to have the matching picture. And I also have a set where it, it shows kids, um, you know, there's a, a matching set of these types of things in smaller form in cards if you wanted to do like a choice board or something. Um, but the words are for the adults, the picture is for the kids, and the name is to remain consistent. So that's going to really help your kids understand where they're going to go to play, right, in this center. Um, what it might look like. Of course, it's not going to look like this all year long. And they're going to also know that um, the name is always going to be the same. So that's really going to help them understand more about the center and how it's going to work. And then you're going to use this um, sign when you're introducing the center, which we'll get to in a moment. So next up is the I can cards. And so these are in my I can card uh, collection. And I have one for each of the centers that I have signs for. And so this one is obviously for the sensory center. And it just says I can with a, a green thumbs up, meaning yes, we can do these things. I can touch. Now I just contradicted myself because here it says I can keep it out of my mouth. So it's still a positive statement, but it does have a negative circle around the top. This is perhaps one of the most important things you're going to teach kids about in this center is not to put it in their mouths. Of course, if you have students who are still mouthing items, then maybe a sensory table is not for you. Um, but generally speaking, in a four-year-old classroom, sensory table is perfectly appropriate. Um, and then I can keep it, whatever it is, in the table. And that's just a positive way of saying, let's not get stuff on the floor. <laughs> and then of course I can sweep up. So after we are finished playing, we are responsible. We, meaning the children, are responsible for sweeping up any messes that might occur. Of course, if it's water, you might have a different type of cleanup that you do. But these are just, there's four for each one. And they're very simple I can statements that are positive instead of negative. And this would be placed right near your sensory center um, so that it's in the kid's view. You can also cut them apart if you'd prefer to put them in um, left to right direction. And these are really going to help your kids remember the suggestions that you're making. Of course, you're going to have to introduce them to this. If you just put it in the center without talking about these things, then it just becomes decor. And now going back to my freebie, my first 10 days of school lesson plans for preschool, um, there's a simple guide to what goes in each center 
for the first day of school. So you can look at it and just because sensory is one of the most popular centers along with Play-Doh and art, dramatic play and blocks, um, these are the basic materials that I'm gonna have out on the first day. I'm not gonna add anything until they understand how this center works, how to clean it up, how to go there, clean up, use the materials appropriately. Um, so these are just gonna be very simple things. You could also do water um, and scoops, sand, sand molds if you're doing water, don't use those, and containers so that they can scoop and pour because that is one of the main focuses of the sensory table. It's not just to keep kids busy, but it also encourages scooping and pouring, which are great fine motor skills, right? And also you can do volume and all kinds of things um, in there as well. But this is on the first page of my um, first 10 days of school lesson plans. And then we have the introduction. So there is a script. A written script if you would like to use it word for word or just take it as a as a guide to um, follow when you're introducing that center to your students all the words are there for you and it also serves as a springboard to remind you of what you need to be telling them because I can't tell you the number of times throughout the years and I would forget just one thing when I was introducing a center and then that would be like catastrophic, right? So we need to make sure that we are listing all the things that we need kids to know in the beginning of the year about using the center. So we're setting our students and ourselves up for success during center time for the entire year when we follow these scripts for introducing. And of course, you're gonna use them again throughout the year to reinforce or remind. And if you're watching along, you can find the link to my first 10 days of school lesson plans in the description box below. Just click where it says show more and then scroll down to find the link to this freebie. If you're listening along, go to prekpages.com and type in first 10 days of school into the search box. Now I'm gonna turn the camera around and give you that sensory table tour that I promised. And we're going to take a look at some tools that you might consider putting in your sensory table. And these tools are good all year long. They're not tied to a theme or a season, but they are proven to be effective at engaging children in the sensory table center. Okay, so here we are in my sensory table center. And you can see um, there in the back, we have the sensory center sign and the cards that say, I can. So the pictures are for the kids. I can uh, touch. I can keep the things out of my mouth. I can keep the things in the table and I can clean up. And now we're going to go top down. And in this particular center, I have the IKEA um, sensory table. And it's it's a, like a multifunctional table where you can put this little slat in the top and make a um, a desk out of it. The the alphabet thing you see on the right, I got that on Etsy. It was a custom thing. Somebody got the genius idea to make little custom inserts for these IKEA uh, sensory tables. And so I will link that um, in the show notes below or over on Pre-K Pages search sensory table. So right now in my sensory bin, I have oatmeal. And I know that a lot of you, depending on where you work, are not allowed to use food. This is what I had on hand, so this is what I'm gonna demonstrate with. But you choose whatever sensory bin filler works for you. And inside my center essentials guide, you will find all the different tools and toys that you can put in your sensory table. So let's start with the obvious here. And the obvious are these cups, right? These measuring cups. The red ones I found at the Dollar Tree and the green ones I found at another dollar store at some point in my career. Don't know exactly when or where, but here you can, the kids can rather, scoop and pour. Scoop and pour. And that is the basic premise of the sensory table. Um, they're scooping and they're pouring. And then I found this really cute scoop at Ikea not long ago. And I like this one a lot. Um, this one is, is easy for the kids to hold on to and easy for them to scoop and pour. And it, it's much bigger. It's almost like a shovel, right? So they really like that one. Next up, I have silicone cupcake 
liners, right? And these are super popular because what do all little kids want to do in the sand or the whatever uh, sensory filler that you have? What do they want to do? They want to play birthday. So they can make little birthday cakes. And um, I have a whole list of different types of activities you can do in the bin. Uh, with different materials but if you were using sensory sand or something like that they could make little cupcakes and then just throw in some birthday candles and they will be engaged for a very long time and of course no sensory bin would be complete without these um, measuring spoons right so i have a whole set there on a ring and i took them off and this is just one of them but they can also fill because these are smaller cupcake liners they might want to fill them with the small um, muffin cups. Then of course I have some bigger ones right there. You can see there's larger ones. Um, and those are really good for sand as well. Next up we have the handy scooper and the handy scooper is exactly what it looks like. You can scoop and pour with these. Obviously the kids are getting lots and lots of fine motor practice when they are using the handy scoopers uh, because it's basically mimicking the scissor skills. These are excellent with water because they have little sieves in them, but they can also completely pick up whatever other material you have and they love doing that. These are especially fun with pom-poms too. Next up we have these gator grabbers and gator grabbers are perfect for little hands. They have little grippy teeth on the inside so the things don't slip out of the mouth and um, they can pick up smaller objects in the bin. So if you were having uh, pom-poms in your bin these would be perfect for picking up the pom-poms and transferring them to the muffin liners or whatever. So these are called gator grabbers and the scoopers are handy scoopers. I have links to those in my Amazon storefront for you linked below this video. This next one is for water play. So if you have water in your sensory bin or table, um, turkey basters, and you get those at the dollar store. Don't spend a lot of money. Don't order them on Amazon, go to the dollar store. And uh, my kids absolutely love using turkey basters in the sensory table. And when they squeeze the bulb, right, it's great fine motor practice because they're highly motivated to squeeze it and release the water. Of course, you have to set some boundaries about what you can and can't do with the turkey baster. So next up, we have these tongs. And these are just some tongs I found at Walmart a couple years ago. They come in, they used to come in all different colors, uh, but you can find tongs just about anywhere. I like these because they're metal and they're very sturdy. Some of the plastic tongs don't last very long. So you can use those to pick up things in the tub. Kids love them because they're like an adult tool that they don't usually get to play with. So next up I have um, like a little scene set up here. So here I'm kind of turning my sensory table into a small world play type of a scenario. So I just have little plastic uh, farm animal figures and some little uh, wooden pieces there. I got those at the Target Dollar section a long time ago, like five years. Um, but you can find things like this at the dollar store. And so now the kids can play in the sensory table and it's also a small world experience and that's perfect for oral language development as well. And of course, over here on this side, I know you wanna see that, that is the um, insert to my Ikea sensory table that I got on eBay, um, not eBay, Etsy. And it has these little cutouts for the letters of the alphabet. So one thing you could do, maybe after reading Chicka Chicka Boom Boom, you could hide the letters in your sensory table, whatever the filler is you're using, and then they can fish them out with tongs and then place them on this little um, mat here. Um, the one thing I will tell you about the mat is that it only works with the very flat letters, not the fat chunky letters. So like things like the letter W, the letter X, the K, the M, um, they all need to be the flat type of letters to fit into those slots. Um, so that is my sensory table. I hope you got some ideas you can take back and use in your classroom. And the number one thing I want you to remember is to always put a little broom, a little dust broom and a little dust pan underneath your table or next to or on the wall, wherever 
um, so that your kids can help clean up. And I put several of those in a little bin under the table. And finally, we're gonna take a look at the Sensory Essentials Guide. This is another free printable that you can grab, again, in the show notes or in uh, the search box at Pre-K Pages. Just type in Sensory Essentials Guide or look directly below this video and you'll find it. And this is a guide that I created with all things sensory inside. I also have a blog post, which I'll link as well at Pre-K Pages, but it talks about um, the mess and how to clean it up um, and solutions for that. It talks about how many kids, where should you put it, what size bin do you need. It talks about safety tips and the controversial use of food. I address that in there. And then I have a list of fillers and there's um, a link to a clickable page where you can get those links. The same with the tools and toys, same thing. And finally, at the very end of the guide, there are pages of different types of sensory bin setups to go along with your themes or your holidays as well and non-food sensory bins too. There's the seasons there. So there's a whole list of those. Those are clickable. You click on each one and it takes you to the full blog post with a materials list and all that good stuff. So this is a free printable again um, available in the link below in the show notes if you're watching along and over at Pre-K Pages type in sensory bin essentials. See it pays to watch or listen to these episodes all the way to the end so you can grab your freebies. And I like to end with some troubleshooting tips because teachers always have questions when I get to this point talking about centers. And so the first one is, what if everybody wants to go to that center? What am I going to do? Now, there are a number of ways you can do it. But if you really want to get the most impact out of center time for your kids, when I've talked about this before, you can go back and watch or listen to some previous episodes where I talk about this. The true purpose of center time is not to get children to play with certain things to learn certain skills. I talked about that in last week's episode but it is rather to help them understand how the world works and so what they're doing is negotiating their space and their materials and so that would be like a problem solving opportunity and that's really what we want our children to be doing during center time is practicing their executive function skills right because those are the most important things that we are developing at the preschool level because they're things that kids need to be successful both in school and in life lifelong these skills are so important that if they're not developed at a young age they can really um, upset learning going forward so we really want to um, help children uh, encourage the growth of their executive function skills and taking away the opportunity for them to negotiate materials and space and problem solve can really have a negative impact on executive function skills. So that's really the purpose. Um, but then again, I'm a realist and I myself have used uh, methods in the past where, you know, there were dots on a, on a piece of cardstock, you know, those types of office colored dots, stickers, and then they would clip their clothespin on. I used that for many years. Um, and then there have been times when I had super small classes, class sizes occasionally, where I didn't need any of that. There wasn't even any need for it because I only had like 10 kids. What did they have to fight about? You know, um, I had enough stuff for everyone to play wherever they wanted. And it was more of a challenge to get like more than one kid to go to a certain center so that they would have a playmate to talk to, right? An oral language. So that's my take on how many kids. But what if everybody wants to go there and they're having trouble negotiating? One of the things that I've done in the past, and I know a lot of other teachers do in their classrooms as well, is have a sign-up sheet because now you're incorporating writing and that print has meaning and all those great concepts of print that we encourage and help develop at the preschool age. And so a blank paper on a clipboard with a pencil attached and encourage your kids to sign their name um, and put their name on the list so that you can give them turns. Now, if your kids are not at the name writing stage, that's totally fine. Uh, one thing we did in Head Start uh, to alleviate that, because I had a three-year-old class and a four-year-old class, was they each had a page full of stickers from the computer printer, you know, with their names on them, and they could place their sticker on the, um, the sign-in thing or the waiting list, right? It's a waiting list. And then I always had 
it had started, I always had another person there who would then call out, okay, now we have another opening in the dramatic play or whatever. Um, but you'd, you're the judge because you have, you know, you, you know your own students. I don't know what age group you work with. So you decide what works best for you and the age group you work with. But the clipboard method is really um, a good way. And then you're going to want to have along with that, like a, a sand timer or a time timer because once kids know that their turn might be ending, it can get a little tricky. And so you want to let them know that we want everyone to have a chance to play in the center. It's very fun and we know that, but it's time for someone else. So then you can use the timer in that case so that they will know when it's time for them to give somebody else a turn. That's one way to do it. There are many ways, like I said. So there you have it, my sensory table tour. Be sure you rate, review, and subscribe wherever you get your podcasts. Until next time, I'm Vanessa Levin, Onward and Upward.